started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ya Feng Yin. Uh, I'm a professor and interim chair of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, uh, University of Michigan. So welcome to the University of Michigan Building the Future Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, in 2019, uh, our department completed a strategic visioning process uh, through which we identify, we identify five strategic directions. Uh, they are shaping resource flow, uh, adaptation, automation, smart infrastructure finance, and human habitat experience, which is the topic of today's webinar. So this direction focuses on advancing new approaches uh, and a solution that aim to enhance user experience in natural and built environment. This is a very exciting focus for our department and also the profession as a whole. Our strategic vision reaffirms our value proposition uh, to our communities, re reinforce our commitment as engineers uh, working in service for society. So to highlight our vision and to formulate a work plan, we launched this Building the Future Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, which provide a forum uh, to discuss each strategic direction. It's aimed to build a broad community network that include industry professionals, researchers, educators, and students. Through presentation from leading experts and panel discussions, this series provides new insights and explore a range of perspective on these five strategic directions. We have had a lot of support to make this vision and today's webinar come together. Uh, we'd like to thank our co-sponsor for, for today's event, uh, Air Relief Technology Inc., Center for Aerosol Impact on Chemistry of the Environment, UCSD, Indoor Chem, Life Stage, Life Stage Environmental Exposure and Disease Center, University of Michigan, uh, I'd like to thank the Strategic Implementation Committee led by Professor San Yong Lee. I also thank Professor Rachel O'Brien, uh, who is Assistant Professor here at the University of Michigan. Professor O'Brien has agreed to serve as a moderator for today's presentation and panel discussion. So lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Joyce Kennedy, Michelle Santayam, and Mark Clear Snyder for providing technical and marketing support for today to today's webinar. A few more words on the accessibility of the webinar. Uh, we would like to make our event accessible to all participants. Uh, so this webinar will have a live automated caption. A transcript will be available. Uh, to choose a viewing option, uh, click live transcript, live transcript on the control bar at the bottom of your screen, where you can show or hide the subtitle or view the full transcript. I will now turn the session over to Professor O'Brien. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Yafeng. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody participating in today's event. Today's distinguished lecture emphasizes the strategic theme of the human habitat experience. To give an overview of this theme, I would like to play a two minute video. Civil and environmental engineering historically have had enormous impacts on the way in which people live their lives. We're focused on all human life. It is global. It is wide reaching, given the broad impact that civil and environmental engineers have around the world. By referring to the habitat experience, the idea is that we are engaged in improving all aspects of the environment in which humans live, work and play. We have a number of faculty, Nancy Love and Jerry Lynch, where their projects are specifically designed to go out and engage the public at the very start with the solutions that are being proposed and even bringing the public into the data collection process. We have multiple research projects here looking at ways to make sure that specifically the indoor air is maintaining healthy conditions in residential and commercial spaces. The research that I do focuses on making sure that airborne pathogens don't live very long if they're emitted into the air. There's also research being done where we're using wearable devices to better track not only human comfort, but better track human activity, human safety in construction environments. All of these are ways in which we can personalize the experience to maximize comfort, maximize safety. There is so much more expectation from the public. And as engineers, if we aren't responsive to that, then we are not doing our job.
All right, during the lecture and panel discussion, I will invite participants to send in your questions using the Q&A function. We will try to get to as many of your questions as time allows. Now, I would like to introduce our very special speaker and panelists. We're very fortunate to have Kim Prather, Distinguished Professor and Chair in Atmospheric Chemistry, UC San Diego, who will speak to us on the topic of the critical role of engineers in science communication during the COVID-19 pandemic. The presentation by Kim will be followed by a panel discussion with our distinguished panelists, Dustin Poppendick and Jim Rosenthal. Dustin Poppendick is an environmental engineer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and Jim Rosenthal is the chairman and CEO of Air Relief Technologies Incorporated. This brings us to today's distinguished lecture. Let me now invite Kim to speak on this theme and to present, give her presentation. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, it's an honor to uh, be giving uh, one of these lectures on, for, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. O'Brien and Dr. Yin uh, for uh, the invitation to be here today. So let me see, I have a shared screen, there it goes. All right, and presentation, okay, did it go, no, okay, all right, hopefully everybody can see that okay. Um, all right, well, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, the critical role of engineers um, during this pandemic. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually a scientist, but I've been sort of... Um, I think I have a brain of an engineer. I think like an engineer. I'm actually in the National Academy of Engineering. Like, um, I think a lot like an engineer. And I think what I like the best about engineering um, is just that it's very solutions oriented. And I realize that that is kind of how my brain works. So as I say, I'm an atmospheric chemist. I've developed tools over the years for I'm um, studying aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, and you know, when the pandemic started, um, I became heavily involved, and I will talk talk about that a little bit today. So a bit of an overview. Um, just quickly, uh, I'll talk a little bit of background on you know how the heck I went from studying aerosols and clouds and climate and the ocean um, and ocean processes to you know, being heavily involved in science communication. Uh, I will say that it wasn't just me. It was a huge team of people, including two of the people that are on the panel um, today. Uh, but it was a really amazing sort of grassroots effort of people coming together across disciplines to um, work together to try and help the public who were highly confused. And I'll talk about that quite a bit today. But Mostly, I want to also focus on set ourselves up for a discussion on solutions. You know, what next? How do we get out of this pandemic? Because I'm a believer that we don't have to just live our lives like this and put up with it. I think there are things we can do. So just a little bit on my background. I am, as was mentioned, I'm the founding director of the NSF Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry of the Environment. I've been doing this, I've been leading this effort for 13 years now, um, and it's sort of morphing from very climate focused to a health focus. Um, and, you know, basically that's one of the ways that I got pulled in, uh, but it's very focused on aerosols and how aerosols are produced and how they move through the air. And, you know, sort of aerosol science as a whole is something that started out in the engineering community. So let's just step back and think about uh, just to touch on where we were and where we are. Um, sometimes they're a little bit too much the same given all that's happened in between. But the bottom line is, is that early messaging, um, you know, how does this virus get, get transmitted? Um, it's through the air. That's the simple answer. However, and, and that's actually what the WHO, World Health Organization, stated clearly on February 11th, 2020. But within five, 10 minutes, after a quick little con side conversation, uh, he came back and said, it's not airborne. I shouldn't have said that. And they took it back. Um, they have a, a tweet. They put up a tweet, which is still on Twitter, um, which a lot of people are pushing on. Like, why is that still there? This is misinformation. Um, they claim they can't remove tweets, but they do. Um, but this one is, you can still find it. And so this kind of is at the heart and soul of, you know, frustration, I can't, I have no other word to describe, um, of many of us, uh, that, you know, the public is, you know, 
confused and rightly so um, because they, they get they hear different things. But the fact is this particular virus and actually many, many viruses, there's a huge airborne component to them. And, you know, it's something that, you know, once it's acknowledged, once people understand, many of us have been delivering the message, then it can be easily fixed. So again, adding to the confusion, you know, they say that it's, you know, it isn't airborne, but it's definitely borne by air. I mean, that's the kind of information that has, has been out there and is sadly still out there. So my, where did I come in? So say I was just quietly running a center and uh, along came a reporter who asked me if I think that, um, you know, SARS, the virus that causes COVID-19 could travel more than six feet. And what comes to mind is, you know, I fly around the world through clouds, aerosols can go all the way around the globe in about two weeks. So yes, I, I, I do think that aerosols can travel further than six feet. And so that led me to write a paper with an a infectious disease doctor here at UC San Diego and a colleague at, um, in, in Taiwan. And basically, we just sort of stitched the pieces together. This virus is getting around mostly in aerosols. It's being released by people who are just simply speaking, singing. Um, they don't know they're sick. And so that is the sneaky side of this virus and how things had, had sort of had unfolded at that time. So this paper ended up being incredibly um, cited, uh, downloaded. It's uh, the most downloaded first paper in science history, I'm told. It really sort of resonated with people. But this was back in, I mean, I wrote it in May of 2020. And here we are. So then, you know, that wasn't enough. I just sort of want to give you a flavor for the different little things we tried. Um, we finally, you know, after, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit, but after some workshops by the National Academy, you know, we basically said there was this arbitrary break that's been there for a long time that separates aerosols and droplets. And I'll talk more about it. It's five microns. And so we basically said, no, that break should be 100 microns. Things that are up to 100 microns can go further than six feet. And then finally, we wrote a review article um, which said it's not just SARS-CoV-2 that's airborne and can go further than six feet. It's all of these different airborne viruses. All of them have some airborne component with the motivation being that if we can protect ourselves and protect everyone from you know, this one virus, at the same time, we're protecting everyone from all of these other illnesses. It's a huge, it's kind of a no brainer from a public health perspective to do something about getting these viruses out of the air. The other thing we did, this was written with people that, you know, uh, Trish Greenhouse led, led the charge on this paper. We stitched together, I mean, all evidence, all evidence pointed at way back then, you know, this is 2021, but even as far back as 2020, everything pointed at airborne. You know, these are 10 solid reasons that all point to airborne. And so, you know, again, you know, it's still, we still had resistance. So my main message from the beginning is, has always been, again, solutions oriented and, and you know, optimistic that once we acknowledge it's airborne, we can fix it. It's a fixable problem. We can clean the air, you know, just like we filter our water, we remove pathogens from water before we drink it. We're exposed to far more air during thousands of times more air during the course of a day. You know, we breathe 22,000 breaths a day. So, you know, and we're, we're perfectly content for some reason to continue to breathe in pathogens and, and other harmful pollutants. So anyway, this is sort of where Twitter came in. And this is what I would say is the good side of Twitter. Um, there is a good side. It brought together many of us, including those of us um, then as part of the seminar, met through largely through Twitter. Um, and so it's just sort of this group of people spanning from, you know, doctors, lawyers, general public, people who just had a general interest in the problem. We came together and started pushing sort of the information out there to help the public because the public was so desperate for honest, straightforward information. So this is just a little, um, a little sort of step through time. We basically, you know, I've met now um, many of the people that I only knew through my computer. Um, these are shown here. This is, uh, we took a, one of these Corsi Rosenthal boxes that I'll talk about. Um, today we took it to the White House. This is Ashish Shah. This is Jim Rosenthal, who you'll see later. Um, Don Milton. Uh, I met the team, Team Airborne. This is the founder of Team Airborne here. And I met her in Bern, and they brought a bunch of very kind notes to me and even made me a 3D printed fact, COVID is airborne. And this 
this doctor that was heavily involved that I met in DC. I mean, I could put up many of these pictures, but kind of everywhere I travel now, I'm finally getting to meet all the people that we've worked so, so closely with over the last few years. So how much of an engine, I was kind of curious, like from the standpoint of you search on airborne transmission, how much of a role have engineers played? This is one way that I kind of look peaked to see. And these are all the different categories of, um, of basically uh, the different types of journals where this term airborne transmission has appeared. And so you can see that um, basically, you know, engineering's everywhere. You know, there's public environmental occupational health, and one could argue that some of those are, are engineering journals. But engineering, infectious disease is here. It's the third ranked one, pretty far down, but it's there. But it was, it's basically largely been driven. I mean, it's air movement, right? And so it's just, you know, understanding, you know, these kinds of uh, how aerosols move through the atmosphere, how they move through a building, how we can protect ourselves from ventilation and filtration. This is right at the heart of engineering and engineers have played a major role in this. So the other thing, just sort of to give you a flavor, in addition to writing papers, in addition to going to Twitter, we, um, this is Lindsay Marr, speaking of an engineer. Um, she, you know, I met her, um, I knew her before, but I've gotten to know her much better through this. We've worked together on many different workshops and this is, our efforts, you know, through TV, Dr. LaPook, who's the chief CBS chief medical correspondent, has become a good friend of mine. Um, he has been a huge advocate for COVID is airborne and helped us in getting the words, word out. We've done, I don't know how many different media interviews um, to try and get it out again to the public. There's also National Academy of Engineering and Sci Sciences and Medicine, NASM, has done multiple workshops, multiple, um, I mean, multiple, multiple, they aren't even all listed here. Um, again, in basically, you know, the main conclusion of the scientists at these workshops and in these reports, it's there's no question that this virus is mostly transmitted through the airborne pathway. And you may say, we all know this, why are you saying it again? And I get that question oftentimes, but, when you walk into a business, what do you see? Do you see filters, air filters, or do you see hand sanitizer? And I know what I see. You know, I see people with no masks. I see people while they're wiping their hands, sanitizing their hands, sanitizing their shopping carts, and no mask. So there's still confusion out there, unfortunately. So this is the view of um, sort of how... Um, off. This is the view of how the current view and the view that's been there for the last few years. This is actually taken from a National Academy workshop. It's a it's a drawing that uh, came from Lindsay Moore, actually from one of her kids <laughs> did it. Um, and it's been used over and over, but it sort of gives the major modes, which is, you know, the focus has always been on droplets. And I'll just say, and Dustin will back me up on this, droplets drop. And that was the fixation of the medical community for the last, you know, at least 50 years. And so that's where the six feet came in. But there's not that many droplets that are produced. There's probably 100 to 1,000 more aerosols for every droplet when you're speaking that are produced. And those aerosols float in the air like cigarette smoke. And if you're in a poorly ventilated indoor space, they can build up just like cigarette smoke as well. And so being six feet away is not enough. Yes, it's worse to be close because it's much more concentrated up close. But the bottom line is aerosols float while droplets drop. And so, you know, sometimes there's still debate. They, they call long range aerosol inhalation. There's terminology, you know, that's airborne and short range is not crazy terminology things. It doesn't matter how far the virus travels. To protect yourself, you want to protect yourself against inhalation because it's in the air. So should it be a surprise? No. We knew SARS-1. Where would you look? This is SARS-2. Look at SARS-1. SARS-1, we know, was basically, this is the MOI Gardens situation with buildings where it actually traveled between floors of a building and people on the upper floors got hit with it higher. And they figured out that it came from outdoor transport of raw sewage. And so, again, you know, it's not, it, at that time, they said it was airborne. And one of the major conclusions of their look, looking into it was they said that the most important thing you can do if something like this ever happens again is to exercise the precautionary principle, which means don't wait until you have all the science lined up and perfect. If there's any chance that something could be transmitted via you know, a certain pathway, in this case, the air, then you should do something to protect people against the potential for that pathway. We did not do that. 
So, but we've known even before then, you know, this goes back to Florence Nightingale, you know, this goes way, way back. This this was published in 1863. You know, she talks about, she wishes that people were forced to bring in fresh air, you know, talks about the concern about schools being crowded and the, the chance of transmission, you know, so she was a nurse and building engineer as they titled her at the time. And so, you know, it goes, goes way, this is, should not be a surprise. And it should not be something that we are still having to talk about at this point. So a couple of questions. Where did the precautionary principle go? You know, we know the virus is airborne. There is zero question about that. And so why, why has there been such hesitancy to use the word airborne? I get asked that question more than any other question. And I can only speculate. Someday maybe we'll know. So you might say, okay, you know, it's clear it's done. You know, people must get it now. And here's more evidence that's not the case. This is a tweet that just came out just a month ago, um, you know, from a pretty well-known infectious disease doctor up in Canada. And, you know, she basically says in complete honestly, honesty, I strongly suggest engineers shouldn't tell ID docs and infection control docs how to manage PPE, personal protection equipment, and outbreaks in hospitals. So here we are. This is part of the problem, right? engineers, you know, look at airflow, they look at how aerosols move, they know they designed the masks, they designed the ventilation system. So why are they somehow not supposed to be commenting? Um, another thing that's gone on is from a medical doctor perspective, what do they believe in, right? Why are they so adamant and not wanting to pay attention to direct measurements? They do these things called RCTs, random control trials. This just came out. It's shocking to me, quite honestly, that you do a random control trial, trial on masks. There's some serious ethical issues. The, the design of the studies is, is seriously flawed, actually, because one thing they're looking at is sort of the protection of the individual in wearing a mask and wearing it properly and wearing the proper mask, which, you know, that's part of the problem. A lot of people don't know. They wear these baggy blue, we call them masks, thinking they're fine. They're not. Um, but it's more than that. Masks in terms of infection control, the number one thing they do is source control, is what we call source control. They block it at the source. You never want the virus to get in the air in the first place. These studies have no way to assess that aspect. And so they're sort of missed, they are missing the point. So just to sort of go at, you know, what's the basic data? And to me, this is one of the most shocking things of the entire pandemic. Um, once, you know, basically there's these things called aerosol, AGMPs, aerosol generating medical procedures. And what they are, they look at the number of aerosols that come out from different activities. And these AGMPs are, you know, intubation and things like that that are listed over here on the right. And then if you compare those though, aerosol scientists came along and said, well, let's look at how many aerosols come out of a human that's just talking or exercising or shouting or coughing a lot more come out of a human um, just from simple activities. And if that person is infectious and doesn't know it or does know it, um, those aerosols actually contain the virus, right? And so, you know, it's sort of the thing that's really crazy is you still hear doctors saying, you know, we wear N95s, the really good respirators whenever we're doing AGMPs. But the point is, is that, you know, these basically in the case of, you know, a doctor dealing with people that potentially have it, and again, we oftentimes don't know the person's sick, what do we give them? We give them a surgical mask. I've been, I can't tell you how many times I've heard stories of people going to the hospital or to a medical facility and being told to take off their N95, the one shown over here, and put on a surgical mask backwards. And so, you know, we give them the poor respiratory protection where most of the aerosols are formed, and we give them the best respiratory protection where there's not as much. And so we argue, this is a paper um, by Wilson in 2021, we argue the risk of aerosol exposure is underappreciate and warrants widespread interventions. Again, this is from 2021 and we're still stuck. So there's a really good paper, this, I'll just quickly mention, um, I wanna make sure that I'm staying on time so we have time for discussion. This was uh, led by Jose Jimenez uh, from University of Colorado. It goes into sort of this, you know, the theory of how disease is transmitted. Um, it actually, there was a period where they realized it was air, it was in the air, viruses were in the air, they called it miasma theory, but then it went back, there became resistance to airborne, and now we've seen the shift back to things being in the air and being accepted as being in the air. 
It's quite an interesting um, paper if you're interested in sort of the history of these things. The other thing that came out was a, a paper or a Lancet study sort of looking at what have we learned? How can we like avoid such messes in the future, for lack of a better term? How can we avoid pandemics in the future? One way is to actually clean the air, indoor air in particular. And so one of the major findings of this commission report, which just came out in the fall, was WHO acted too cautiously and too slowly on several matters. One was in, in endorsing the public use of face masks as protective gear or respirators, and to recognize the airborne transmission of the virus. And, you know, I will still say if you do a search in Twitter and you look for the word airborne and WHO, they still are avoiding the use of the word airborne. They will tell you to ventilate the importance of ventilation. They'll tell you to wear masks, but they still will not use the word airborne for whatever reason. So if we think about like, where are we in terms of understanding air quality, again, a very engineering problem, you know, we basically have focused all of, like the money, the investment has gone into cleaning outdoor air, which is a good thing. Um, people turn, you know, sort of think of outdoor air as much safer than indoor air because things are more dilute. You can't tell that here. Outdoors, it's, it's pretty darn dirty. And, you know, air pollution is responsible for killing about an extra 7 million people per year. The other thing is that 70, 70, 70 to 75% of the people globally live in areas where concentrations of PM, particulate matter, uh, go exceed the health WHO's limit of 10 micrograms per cubic meter of being unhealthy or breathing unhealthy air. That's outdoors. So we're very, you know, as a, as a world, as a globe, we're very fixated on outdoor air. What about indoor air? Well, we spend 90% of our time indoors. And here's the punch, you know, this is these two things on the left to sort of show the pie chart and then the time of day show how little time we actually spend outdoors. Most of our exposure to air pollution, to, you know, and to any sort of respiratory disease, it's going to come indoors where indoor air pollutants can be two to five times higher than out outdoor levels. They can be over a hundred times higher routinely indoors because things just build up. But a lot, most places do not have good ventilation. And so, you know, basically where we, what we should be worried about is our indoor air. Um, and we just, for some reason, it has been neglected. I will say that is, I don't, I don't know if there's a silver lining in a pandemic, but I will say this pandemic has drawn attention to the type of air we breathe and the poor air we breathe indoors. So there's been a shift. A big shift. This was a paper led by um, Lydia Moroska, uh, which was to start thinking about better design for buildings. You know, how do we combat, um, you know, these high pollution levels inside and start thinking about things like air changes per hour. I think, you know, my neighbors now know, know the term air changes per hour. Um, you know, homes, it's about one air change per hour, which is very low. Hospitals get up to about 12 in areas where they're worried about respiratory protection. So that means, you know, basically it's every five minutes or so you get, in theory, sort of fresh air. Um, schools is less than two. It's much less than that in reality in most schools that people check. Yet, Parents will go, I want, you know, I want to make sure my kids are breathing clean air at school. And what's the, what do the administrators tell them most of the time? It's fine. We've got it. We, we, we've got it covered. We've cleaned the air. It's sort of those kinds of hand-waving answers. So we went in, I actually helped San Diego Unified School District, which is one of the largest ones in the United States. And we were successful through Delta. It got more challenging as Omicron and the other variants came along. I would, you know, we, we would argue that we just should never, if we nipped it in the bud, we wouldn't have had these variants that got so much more difficult to control, but we we're able to measure things. This is engineering 101. You can actually measure particles, how many particles are in the air. You can measure ventilation, the level of ventilation using this little CO2 meter that I show here. We actually had in the classrooms, they had these little QR codes that people, the parents could take a snap of and then go learn because a lot of times parents and teachers and even kids they don't really understand why these things are there. Why is the filter running? You know, why, why, why are the windows open? Why is the door open? So there's just all kinds of ways that we can actually go into improving indoor air quality. We can, you know, these are sort of listed here and I have a feeling they will come up in the discussion. Um, this is something that's just sort of missing in um, when the implementation part 
has been lacking is what I will say. So we can, again, talk more. But again, when you clean indoor, when you increase ventilation, you decrease CO2, and it's been shown repeatedly that that increases attendance, attention, and test scores. So it's a win-win all the way around, including the public health side. So uh, we have uh, Jim Rosenthal will, uh, is here, and he has um, been incredibly helpful. Um, he and Corsi also um, looking at sort of making these little boxes, these handmade boxes, which I talk, I've talked so much about people think that I have some sort of um, vested interest. I don't, other than protecting people's health. They work incredibly well, and in fact, they outperform HEPAs. And so I like them because, and I push them because it's an equity issue. More people can have access to these. They cost, if you build them yourself, takes about, I don't know, between 15 and 30 minutes, depending on how many you've built. Um, you know, you tape them together. We can talk more about it. it costs about $70. Some people say they look ugly. I think they're beautiful when I think about the, what, you know, the job that they're performing. This just shows, you know, sort of the, the, the how, how simple they are to put together, duct tape, and you've got the box. You know, they cost way less. They can be quiet. Most people don't know that it's best to just run them on low. Um, so there's just, you know, they can supplement up to, and they can get you up to 12 air changes per hour. We're getting near hospital level air changes per hour by sticking a couple of these in the, in the classroom. And I, again, you know, thinking about them, what are they doing? The simple way is they, they are breathing in air at 2000 times the rate a human can. So they just filter the, 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 you know, the pollution, the wildfire smoke, the allergens, the respiratory viruses, they'll, it goes into that box instead of your lungs. And, you know, they can be, they can be cute. And so, you know, there's all kinds of designs that are all over the web. It's been fun to watch people build these. So the last thing I'll say is, do they work? The most recent paper that just um, came out talking about sort of, you know, how they reduce risk and lower exposure levels is shown here. Um, and basically, I'll just give you a nutshell. They took a source is shown here, a little map of people. And you can see that, you know, they basically released aerosol at one location and looked at the exposure. What they found is with just HVAC alone, yellow is high levels of particulate matter or aerosols, 29.4, which is, is, is high. Um, and you can see that with just HVAC, it stays high. If you start, they started playing around with putting one in the front and one in the back, one in the, you know, one basically, um, you know, different started at, you know, at different uh, sort of speeds, high and low. And then finally, purple is really low concentrations. And you can see they put one at the front and one at the back. So two in a room, particles are gone. So it's hard to, to surprise anybody by saying we took out the aerosols in the air, so they aren't there to be inhaled. What does that do? It reduces the chance of you inhaling them and getting infected. You can see that the best scenario in sort of overall exposure was going from, you know, looking at, they, have un, they compared unmasked and masked, right? And so clearly the best is to run two of these and have people masked. But I would argue that as time goes on, if we really clean indoor air environments, we won't have to have the masks as people ask me forever. Um, we can actually clean indoor air. It matters that we do that first. So, you know, what would it cost? It's, you know, depending on how much you estimate, if we want to put one in every school in the U.S., um, you know, it's about, works out to be about $4 per student per year. Um, you know, uh, basically, it's a huge equity issue because sometimes people will say, well, why don't you just open the window? But there's people that live in places that have such poor air quality or regions that they can't open their windows and their doors. So this would allow everyone, these would allow, the supplemental aspects will allow everyone um, to reduce asthma, allergies, you know, sort of everything that you can think about. And, uh, and again, sort of just the overall ventilation concept of lowering CO2 levels, I should say, um, will improve cognitive function. So, you know, question is why not? And we'll have more discussion about that, I'm sure. So SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes um, COVID-19 is airborne. And we really still are pushing, um, trying to get, you know, the public health agencies to make a clearer message. And, you know, the public deserves to understand why. Um, you know, it's been shown that if people understand why they're told to do something, they have a greater chance of actually doing it. We've known since back in, you know, again, long ago, here's just a picture of 1918 kids outdoors in class. You know, this is their outdoor classroom um, during the pandemic, the pandemic we had over 100 years ago. And so, you know, the public is, you know, 
everyone in the public, little kids understand how these, how these filters work. And, you know, again, also just understanding why the more layers of protection you use, the safer you will become. In addition to saying what to do, it also tells you what not to do, you know, not to not to be the one when you're speaking to remove your mask, not to be indoors in crowded settings when, when you know, the pattern, the circulation patterns are high. Plexi without a mask underneath, you know, sort of plexi barriers can trap aerosols and actually make it worse. You know, think about if you were on the other side of a plexiglass barrier from someone who's smoking, do you think you'd smell it? Of course you would. And it can actually make it worse, again, make it worse. People wearing these face shields with no mask, it can get trapped inside, that's not a good thing. Distance is a good thing, even indoors. Singing, the more you yell, the more you exert yourself, the more aerosols and ventilation. You know, I'm just so much more sensitive to ventilation. I take my CO2 sensor everywhere I go in public places. So, um, you know, we're not done yet with this pandemic. I hope the more people that can get educated and think about these things and spread the word, the sooner that we'll get there. So, you know, short term, filter indoor air, add these filtration devices. Who cares if they use, you know, they're using duct tape. You can make them as nice as you want. Um, longer term, there should be an indoor air standard, just like we have one for outdoors. You know, other ideas, um, you know, this is a, a, a talk by Paula Osuski, and she talked about, you know, we really need a task force to sort of think about schools, you know, protect our kids. And, you know, what could we do? You know, what, for the longer term, what should we be doing? And I hope this is something that we can um, have a conversation about. So I'd like to thank everybody for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. All right, thank you so much. Um, that was a absolutely amazing uh, presentation and a very inspiring talk. Um, so at this point, I would like to transition to the panel discussion. So I'm gonna invite our panelists to unmute themselves and to turn on their cameras. And while they're doing that and we're getting everything set up, um, I am going to do some brief introductions, um, again, for anybody who joined us a little bit late. Uh, so we have three panelists here. Our first panelist is our speaker, uh, and that is Professor Kim Prather. Uh, Kim Prather is a distinguished chair in atmospheric chemistry and distinguished professor at the University of California, San Diego. She received her PhD from UC Davis, and at San Diego, her research is focused on atmospheric chemistry with a particular focus on aerosol particles. During the pandemic, Professor Prather has been the leading voice in airborne transmission, as well as the methods that we can use to protect against the spread of airborne viruses, and she's received numerous awards throughout her work. Um, I'm only going to be able to cover a few of these. Uh, so she is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. And then I just received news that this morning she also found out that she has been awarded the Gustavus John Eslin Award from the American Chemical Society um, for her science communication efforts. Our two other panelists are first Jim Rosenthal, who is a co-founder of Air Relief Technologies Incorporated, um, which is the parent company for Texas Air Filters. So he has been in the air filtration uh, industry since 1997, uh, and he is Certified Air Filtration Specialist from the National Air Filtration Association. Uh, he's been a leading voice on air filtration methods to improve indoor air quality during the pandemic. And then our third panelist is Dustin Popendick. Dr. Popendick is an environmental engineer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. He received his PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. So he is a fellow of the International Society for Indoor Air Quality and Climate, and he has been investigating indoor air chemistry for multiple decades. So at this point, I'd like to start with our questions, um, assuming we're all set. And I'm gonna start with some of the ones that were submitted in advance. Um, we had a number of, of questions submitted, so this is kind of a, a summation of, of a group of them. Uh, but I'd like to invite our, our panelists to give us some general comments around the numerous questions uh, concerning air cleaning technologies and methods like ventilation, uh, and addition, tie that into regulations and think about how we can protect ourselves and how we can actually move forward um, to get beyond this pandemic. So uh, I'd like to open the floor to our panelists. Uh, Jim, if you'd like to start. Sure. Um, great presentation, Kim. That was really, really well done. Um, and, and we have known each other for two years. Um, I, I received an email to, that I needed to join Twitter and follow Lindsay Marr and did and uh, wound up making some wonderful friends uh, who are co-workers on this indoor air issue. 
Um, I think a few things that stick out. One is that we, we need to focus on measurement. Um, we, we need to understand that if we don't measure it, we're never going to be able to fix it. So um, Kim presented this little CO2 meter. I think that's a wonderful, very effective device. Um, but there are other things, particle counters. Uh, she showed that also. Um, I think that that's that's the first step. If we understand what the problems are, then we can start um, we start making some progress on on solving them. The other thing is um, I, I, there, we need to make sure that it's that we have equity that that. This goes throughout the society. It's not just certain people who can afford certain things uh, benefit from the work we're doing. And that's why I think this Corsi Rosenthal box is important. And, and uh, it's, it was started as an open source thing. Nobody's making any money on Corsi Rosenthal boxes. It was the right thing to do. Um, and we are, we're so happy that people all over, all over the world have been using this uh, technique to lower their you know, level of infectious dose. So it's, it, it's, it's been a, a, a good journey. So those are some things we can do. I think we can, we can expand this Corsi Rosenthal box idea for $70, you can make them uh, put two in a classroom and dramatically decrease uh, the transmission of disease in a classroom. Plus, uh, protect you from wildfire smoke and allergens and all the airborne things that are in a classroom. Thank you. I I guess you'd like to, yeah, jump in. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to start off with, um, yeah, Twitter joined me with this community and, and um, so there are some positives. Um, also, I am a federal employee and uh, what I say for the rest of the seminar is my own views, not the views of NIST or the federal government. Um, I think we need to, you know, step back and, and take a look at water and, and how water how regulations evolved over the century. Uh, you know, environmental and civil engineers have saved more lives than all the doctors ever have in history in just 100 years of water treatment. And how did we do that? Well, first of all, we defined the problem with John Snow finding the Broad Street pump and actually getting, took years, took maybe some would say decades to get a consensus on waterborne diseases. Once we had that, then we developed the technologies, the treatments, the sand filters, the disinfections to mitigate the waterborne diseases. And then eventually we moved on to regulations and we actually have regulations in water for what the biological levels can be, what the chemicals can be. And we didn't start where we are now. It's really important to remember that it took decades to get all of these things. We didn't start by saying that we have to measure PFAS in water. We started by saying the BOD needs to be a certain level. Um, and so now consumers don't think of, well, you know, and then we got to the point where we're reporting annually. There is a report. Everybody knows what's in their drinking water. Once a year, you get a report on what it's, it's there. Consumers don't think about what's in their water. They just know it's clean, but they also know if they're educated enough, know not to go into a muddy puddle and drink that water. And we need to do that with air. So in air, we're still at the problem and treatment stage. We're still trying to figure out how do we define the problem? What is the problem? What are all the technologies that will work? What technologies won't work? Um, and we, we, in air, we have a different way that we go about these things currently. We have non-regulatory bodies that advise for um, advising for building construction standards like ASHRAE, and that gets incorporated into, into some local -like regulations. But what we really need is a state and local uh, and federal standards because engineers are really good at designing for a known problem and targeting a known regulation. And until we have that, we're not going to get the movement on the air quality. So we need that driving force that we can actually design to. And it, the, the real critical point that I think needs to be thought about is it doesn't need to be perfect. You know, we didn't, as I said, we didn't start with regulating PFAS and water when we talked about water treatment. We started with the low hanging fruit and what we could achieve immediately. And we started improving the really bad things. And slowly we built up over time to get excellent water quality. And we need to do that in air quality. We need to start finding these low hanging fruit where we can get consensus and regulations. Personally, I don't really care if a building is 800 or 1,000. I care if that build, if PPM of CO2. I care if that building is at 5,000 PPM. And we have schools that are at that level. We have kids who are trying to think in buildings that have 4,000 ppm of CO2. And I think we can start creating regulations and standards 
for performance-based metrics that people can do. Really need. So I think that's where we need to start moving towards. Thank you, Kim. Uh, do you have any um, response? I think I think I had my my chance to answer that as I was going. So let's try and get through more of the questions because I see there's quite a few. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of these coming in. Um, so for our next question, I want to go back to this idea that's been raised a couple of times, this idea of CO2 levels and CO2 monitors. Um, can I get some comments on on the actual use of this um, in buildings, right? So what about perspectives for, for having these visibly displayed so that everybody can get um, kind of an instant read on what the CO2 levels are? And then how would people think about this if they're in different environments, if they say have an air purifier like a Corsi Rosenthal box in the room, how does that impact their interpretation? Well, the, uh, the CO2 meter is really the, the alarm. It's the smoke alarm. It, it tells you that there's not ventilation. Yeah, you know, my hair, it's 550 in my, in my, in my office. Um, it, it tells you, it, it gives you the, an idea of, of when there's a problem and, and that you need to start working for a solution. You need to either ventilate more, filter more, uh, it, it gives you gives you great data that that gives you a, just a better environment if, if you listen to it. I always I, I'm avid go on an airplane, always take my CO2 meter, and and it's really fun because I get all kinds of looks and mostly dirty looks. Um, but when you when you enter the airplane and you're you're there. Uh, during the entrance period, a lot of times the HEPA filters are not working and the CO2 level easily goes up to 2400 ppm. That means about 5% of the air you're breathing at that point is coming out of somebody else's lungs. Um, it is, it, it's just outrageous. And, and I, I guarantee you, if we had in the airplane in front of each section on the front wall, if you had the, 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 C, the CO2 number, if it was 2400, we'd be doing something about this. We, we would be able to solve this problem if we had that information out there. Go ahead, Dustin. So I, I see CO2 monitors, I see three major things. Number one is transparency. Um, it's just like health grades. You're not gonna go into a restaurant that has a test on a health grade and it's not a rat in the back or something and, and thing. Um, and so we need these things and to provide transparency to our, our densely occupied spaces and schools and other commercial spaces. It gains occupant trust. Another important thing is that anytime you have these monitors, they actually measure temperature also and relative humidity. And it's really important to remember that, you know, IEQ can also be IEQ, environmental, envir indoor environmental quality. Can people respond to thermal comfort? If there's a thermal comfort problem, people are going to complain about it. So when you have the ability to measure CO2, we need to tie that into also thermal comfort because if we can get people to buy in that thermal comfort is important, then we can also tie it into CO2. The next big thing with these CO2 monitors is the responsibility. It shouldn't be the, the responsibility of the occupant to address high CO2 levels. It should be the responsibility of the building operator. We, people who are using indoor spaces are not there to constantly monitor a CO2 monitor and open and close windows and things like that. The people who operate the buildings need to be responsible. And so these air nut sensors are great, but we need things that are, that are logging real time and uh, somebody can monitor from a remote space so they can actually see where the problems are. And that's where some of these school districts that are applying these monitors that can look at classroom rods right, and see where the problems are from both the thermal comfort and the CO2 are really great. And the last thing I want to address is CO2 monitors are, despite the fact I love them, are not the silver bullet, silver bullet and neither are air cleaners. You know, CO2 is really only good for densely occupied spaces. It's not going to tell us whether air quality is good or not in spaces that aren't densely occupied. My office, I have two people in it, and I, you know, I could have a really bad chemical in here that got dragged in from the lab this morning. That's not going to be represented by CO2. Also, air purifiers, you really, if you're going to try and get a credit for having air purifiers, purifier for a high CO2, you need to be aware that that really needs to be addressed by a, a professional if we're going to get that credit, because you can have people put in an air purifier, one may not be on, two, it may be sod, well undersized, 
and three, air purists can sometimes, depending on the type of air cleaning technology, negatively impact other parameters of indoor air quality. Air cleaning is not just biological, it's not just air, um, uh, particles and viruses, but it's also chemicals. And we need to be aware of what we're doing from a chemical perspective. And so air cleaning, most air cleaning technologies really only address particles. And so we need to make sure that we, we're talking about air cleaning, we're, we realize that there's no real silver bullet. We have to take into account ventilation, we have to take into account particles, uh, uh, air cleaning thing, but it's all going to be a combined effort. It's not, there's no single thing that we can do, but we can use CO2 monitors to identify those really poorly ventilated, densely occupied spaces and get people to act on them if we have appropriate regulations. I'll just quickly um, chime in. Just, uh, I, I agree. <laughs> the comments are so good. Uh, and I just want to make one point because there's actually I'm kind of looking at the questions and the chat that are coming in and trying to think about it. I mean, there is confusion over the CO2 um, sensors. They are they are the simplest, you know, most available thing that we have. And so, but they only get you so far. And a lot of times people get really confused. Like even on an airplane, when you see it at 3,600 ppm, um, that looks bad. We want it to be what number do we want? Well, we'd like it to be like outdoors, which is what, 420. Um, but less than 800, we're, I'm pretty comfortable. Um, it just tells you how fresh air is basically what it tells you. Um, but if you have filtration running as airplanes do, um, the CO, it's not going to change the CO2 level. So sometimes people get confused by that. Um, and I get asked that question quite a bit, which brings me to my final point, which is we can get the tools exist to clean indoor air. The tools exist to measure indoor air. We have everything we need. The science supports what we're saying. Like we need to do something. And so what I see is implementation is a big problem. And part of that is just the education component. Um, you know, I can't tell you, we have filters here at UCSD. We have Corsi Rosenthal boxes in all in the main large lecture halls. I won't lecture if I don't have a CR box next to me um, and or between me and the audience. Um, and so, and even then I still will wear my mask when things are bad, but you know, I can't tell you how many times I walk in that room and that box is unplugged. There's no, you know, and these are, you know, professors that should know better, but there you have it. But in schools, it's even worse. And so one of the things we did in San Diego Unified was we ran these particle counters around and kept those in different rooms that had poor ventilation. And then the facilities people would see if one got started getting really super high on particles, which is where the virus is. And they would go find inevitably, you know, someone had turned off the box. But, you know, people turn them off because they, they don't know that you're supposed to run them on low. And then it's fine. Um, so there's just a lot of education and a lot of steps behind. It's not the lack of science or measurements. That was one of the points I want to make. It's implementation and education that we have to somehow do better on. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this is a wonderful discussion. Um, so I want to bring this, we have, I think, time for one more question. I want to kind of bring this back to, to the overall theme of this talk. And, you know, that's communication and really trying to get this message out, um, but communicating on multiple levels. So communicating across different fields, but also for scientists, but non-scientists and non-engineers to be able to communicate the needs. Um, and so any recommendations that our panelists have uh, for, for how people in the audience um, or, or any of us uh, can start to, to try to facilitate these types of changes um, in our spaces. Well, it's communication, people forget this, but communication is repetition and, and being able to repeat the message over and over is, is, is very important. Uh, and then it's, and then it's education. I mean, how, how do we bring this to the elementary school students? How, how do we, how do we make sure that people understand things like what the, the, what a PPM is? And, and in that regard, I'm, I'm actually somewhat um, encouraged by the fact that we are smarter today than we were three years ago. Uh, the general public knows much more about air filtration, about CO2 levels, about all kinds of different things. Um, it, it, and it's, it's not the majority of people, but it, certainly there are a lot of people that, that understand uh, what, what needs to be done. So yeah, I think it is repetition, having the message, uh, repeating it, 
Uh, one thing we're doing this Corsi Rosenthal box idea when uh, so it's not a it's not a product it's a movement and it's all over the world and we we have started a foundation called the Corsi Rosenthal Foundation and the idea is to put together um, class programs that go to different schools all over the country and make sure that these things are taught and learned this is the best STEM project that I've ever seen um, and it teaches so much uh, and I think if we start young and make sure that the people, that, that, that kids learn about this, you know, a lot of times they're the best educators. So um, that's what I think needs to be done. I, I would go back to Rich Corsi 20 years ago said, uh, we need more so, uh, sociologists and psychologists in the field studying indoor air. And I'm really a novice at how to convince other people on what to do. And you know, from where I sit, I see the problem with indoor air quality is, is somewhat related to not wanting to change and, and inertia and finding reasons not to change. And a lot of it is, you know, people see their side of things as morally right. And you know, you can look at the recent debate on gas stoves. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's become a moral question of, of what your morals are versus somebody else's morals. Um, when it, you know, all I want to say is gas stoves and make your indoor air quality worse. Um, and so how do we communicate that in a way that, that benefits not just a few, but the masses? And to me, I, I think focusing on the improvements of individuals' lives as opposed to big picture things focusing improvement on your financial situation, your health, and things like that, where you can see immediate benefit, benefit impacts of, you know, increased performance in your schools and things like that. I think that's uh, one of the big picture ways I would go about it. Thank you. Uh, Kim, do you have any final thoughts? Not on, not on that question. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, then, uh, in the last minute or two, I'd like to uh, finish up with any final thoughts from our panelists on any of the topics that were raised today um, in terms of communication and education and really just this, this question of indoor air quality. Okay, I'll go. I'll go. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, first of all, I want to, again, thank you for holding this. Um, there's, uh, as you, I see, there's a lot of interest in this. It's nice to see so many people who care, and we just have to get the word out. I keep thinking, you know, the word has somehow, um, and I, one of the things I'm doing, I didn't mention, but, um, you know, I, there's questions about how do we, how do we do this, and you know, I sort of started at the big level of thinking WHO, CDC, and there was not enough movement there, um, the White House. Um, but now I'm sort of working with the state of California, which has led the, I sort of convinced them that, you know, we led the charge in cleaning our outdoor air. So why don't we lead the charge in indoor air? So I, I believe in, you know, little levers and I'm hopeful that we can sort of pass some, and I know there are states that are doing this, um, that are starting to go after this, this clean air standard. So that, gives me lots of hope. I mean, we all, I keep hearing like, you know, don't we want our lives back? Of course we all want our lives back. And I think we can have them back. We just need to, you know, I'd be, I feel more comfortable if we would clean indoor air first. And then um, I'd be, again, I'd be more content. I'm getting my life back as well, because this has been dragging on way too long. So that's my last comment. Thank you. And thanks again for having me. Thank you all so much. Um, that was an amazing presentation and I really enjoyed uh, this panel discussion. Um, so I'm just going to have some closing remarks um, and thank everyone for attending. Uh, please let us know your thoughts about this event by responding to the short survey um, that's going to be added as a link in the chat. Um, I'll also highlight that this video is going has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, it will take about a week or two uh, for closed captioning to be finalized. Uh, but if you have uh, interest in revisiting any of these topics, uh, you can find it there. You can also uh, please visit umservicetosociety.org to explore our strategic directions here at the University of Michigan. Uh, and we also have a new LinkedIn page with some information on it. Um, so please uh, feel free to explore that there. Um, thank you all so much for attending. Um, and, you know, this was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and 
I am yeah, so happy that we had the opportunity to, to, to have this discussion uh, and to really share these ideas because I think this is incredibly important moving forward. So thank you.